are in a series um, right now called Redefined. And when we say Redefined, it's about a... We're, we're discussing for 16 weeks. We've devoted 16 weeks to discuss, to look at and study the preaching of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5 all the way to 7, otherwise known as the Sermon in the Mount. And so if you know your Bible, you know where it is, and you know what is being taught there, some of the greatest teachings that we somehow have, have absorbed, you know, in our lives, perhaps, you know, have come from this preaching. And so that is why we've devoted 16 weeks. We are already in our 11th week. Would you believe that? 11 weeks of preaching about and hearing about the Sermon in the Mount. And we're so glad that many of you, you know, you've been sharing about how this has helped you. And we are praying, that's our, been, that's our prayer, that this would help us deepen our walk with God, as well as when we apply this, we would experience the blessings, you know, with it. Now, when we speak of redefine, Jesus is, um, or was at this time, you know, he redefined for his listeners, um, his disciples, you know, um, about the values of the kingdom of God. They've been taught and they're very familiar about the value system of their generation, of their time and of the world. But Jesus somehow was opening or opened their eyes so that they could see what is the value system of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus redefined for them what it means to have a blessed life. Jesus redefined for them what it means to be a Christian and how the impact, the, the, the authority, the influence that God has given us. He also redefined for us how we ought to relate with one another and redefined for us how we can relate with God. And so we talked about, you know, the importance of, you know, um, um, giving in the right attitude, the right heart, of praying and fasting in the right heart. Last week we talked about prayer as our way of growing in our relationship with God. Today, as we somehow, you know, uh, focus more on chapter 6, the middle part of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to be um, discussing, we're going to be preaching, we're going to be looking at, you know, what God has to say about this very, very important topic. It's called money, okay? Can you imagine Jesus, as he was preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he was teaching them about the important truths of the kingdom. He included truths about money. In fact, if you would look at the preachings of Jesus, some experts would say that Jesus preached about money five times more than any other topic there is. Can you imagine that? He devoted most of his preaching airtime, you know, preaching about money five times more than any other topic. Randy Alcorn, a famous writer and um, a Christian pastor, even said, you know, that if you would somehow make a percentage of Jesus' preaching, Jesus preached 15 times about money and possessions and wealth and he preached more than heaven and, hell, uh, heaven and hell combined. Can you imagine the emphasis that God gave, that Jesus gave about this topic? So much so because I, I believe he, because he understands the world that we live in. How many of you know that it is important for us to have money? I mean, we will not go about our day every single day you know, without money. I mean, just go out of your room, go out of your house. When you want to go to the mall, it involves money. When you want to do your groceries, it involves money. When you want to, you know, um, study in school, it involves tuition fees. When you're looking for a job, one of your main considerations is money. Some of you, when you were in college, you wanted to do something else. You wanted to study this, but because somehow this course has more money in it, you decided to take this course. Why? Because most, if not all, of life's decisions involve money. And Jesus knows that. God knew how important it is for mankind. And that is why he needed to preach. He needed to speak about money more than all other topics that he preached about. Now, another interesting um, fact is this. If you look at some of the topics that are commonly preached in churches, there's a study. Um, if you read Christianity Today, they say, that the top 10 most preached topic about in, 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 in the churches worldwide, top 10, okay, none of them is about money. Can you imagine? Jesus preached 15% of his time, airtime, you know, preaching about money, but in churches, seldom do we talk about money. Why is that? In fact, um, one famous uh, preacher, his name is Pastor Timothy Keller, in his preaching, he said, 
he was doing a he was doing a lecture for several days and he had several topics but during the time that he was supposed to talk about money possessions greed somehow the attendance dropped <laughs> and so I, I don't know but maybe it, there's something about money that many people perhaps think that that's not our issue Yes, it's important that probably we're saying, ah, maybe I know more. I know about that already. I, I, I know what the Bible has to say about that. And maybe I know, you know, um, how to handle money. But then again, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, be careful. Be careful with worldly possessions. Because deep inside, you know, this money, okay, deep inside this topic is an issue that we ought to be aware of. In fact, can you imagine if God is emphasizing describing the need for us to understand money, but yet somehow we don't want to hear about it. Could it be that God knows something about this that we don't know about? Money in general is actually neutral. Money per se, the money, the pesos, the dollars, the pounds, the euros that you have, you know, it's, it's neutral. In fact, as many people say, money is relative. You know that saying, money is relative? Because the more money you have, the more relatives you have. <laughs> no, seriously, money is actually neutral. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with money per se. The Bible never, you know, teaches about us not having money. But did you know that science says that money can be very dangerous? Science, um, some scientists, when they studied some of our bills that we use, they say that about 80% of them contains disease-carrying microorganisms. And so you never know where your money came from. You never know kung kanikaninong hands dumaan yan, okay? So that is why they say money is kind of dirty, okay? That's what they say. Money is dirty. Okay, in fact, it is so dangerous, it can even affect one's brains. Did you know that? Did you know that money has the power to affect a person's mind? If you want to try this, okay, try lending okay, um, some money to your friends and you will see the damage it makes in their memory. Okay? <laughs> money is neutral, but yet it has the power. It has a power that we ought to be aware of. It has a power that we ought to be um, educated of, be aware of, so that we would not you know, be enslaved by it. Instead, we can use it in the way that honors and pleases God. And so, again, going back to those, interest, those two truths, statistics, if God is emphasizing this, and some of us, somehow, we say that probably we are, we know how, how to do this, you know, could it be that there's something deeper? Could it be that there's a deeper issue? In fact, if you would look at people who have money and people who don't have money, some of them have money and some of them they don't have, but both are actually happy. And some people who have money and some who don't have money, some of them are unhappy. And so if you would look at these two sets of people, have money and have not money, but they have different responses. And so could it be that it's not about the money, as Rihanna would say, it's not, it, there's something deeper that God wants to highlight. That's why God wants us to understand this. And you know what that issue is that God wants us to be aware? It's not money per se, but the love of money. Otherwise known as greed. What is greed? Greed is an inordinate desire to accumulate more wealth. It is an inordinate, insatiable desire for more money and more possessions. And it's, it's something that we want more. We want to hoard and have more of things. Pastors, you know, as we were um, discussing this, we even said, you know, this is a real issue that we really need to speak about in church. In fact, our pastors here in Victory Ford, they're so convinced, okay, that greed is an issue. They even gave levels to it. Do you know that there are different levels of greed? There's greed one, greed two, greed three, <laughs> greed four. Okay. Sorry for the coordinates uh, of our pastors, but so sorry for that. I, I just had to say that. I won't tell you who, told, uh, who gave us that um, remark. 
But maybe some of you already have an idea. <laughs> Going back again to Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, be careful and be on your guard against greed. Imagine Jesus himself say, not just be careful, but be on your guard. Be doubly careful about this. Because there's something, there's this, there's this, there's a nature of this greed, this sin that is very sneaky. It's like a sneaky virus that creeps into your system and most of the time you don't know that you have it until someone else points it out to you. Most people, if not all people, who are affected by this virus, they don't know that they have it until someone else points it to them. In fact, it is so easy to dismiss this that whenever we would see someone else who is richer than us or someone who's more greedy than us, we can say, oh, that's his problem, not mine. Greed has a way of masking itself. That is why God said in Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, be careful, be on your guard against greed. And so the question that we want to ask ourselves is if God wants us to understand this, and if God is pointing out the love of money as the root of all kinds of evil, if greed is an issue that we ought to be aware of, the question is, how do we know if it is in us? If it is so sneaky, and if oftentimes people who have it are not aware of it, how do we know if it's an issue for us? Another question is, if we find out that we are having this issue, how can we overcome it? And so to answer these questions, I want to read to you again from Matthew chapter 6, what the Bible is saying about money, wealth, possessions, and greed. Verse 19, it says here, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust, rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust, nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus, again, deemed it necessary to be for, for this issue about money, wealth, and greed to be included you know, in his sermon in the mount. His famous saying, because he wants us to understand how can we determine if we are affected by greed and how we can overcome greed. And by, in order for him to answer this, you know, he gave us three pictures. In fact, three comparisons. He talked about two treasures, and then he talked about two sets of eyes or two different eyes. And then he talked about two masters or two kingdoms. Let's go first with his presentation. He's preaching about these treasures. In verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Part of Jesus' teaching is he wants his listeners, his disciples, even for us today, to not store for ourselves treasures on earth. Now, what does this mean? Again, let me tell you, to answer what this means, let me tell you what it does not mean. See, this scripture is not pertaining, okay? It does not mean that you and I ought not to have possessions. In fact, if you would look at the promises in scripture, many of them involves possessing things. When God blessed Abraham, it involved land. It involved a house. It involved livestock. And so God wants us to have possessions. In 1 Timothy, it says there that God richly provides for you and me so that we can enjoy it. And so it's not an issue of having possession. It's not an issue of enjoying what God has blessed us with. It's also not an issue of saving. Okay? To store up treasures for yourselves, it's not about not to save. Okay? Because the Bible also says in Proverbs 22, God wants us to learn from the ants. Okay, the ants, what they do is they store for the winter. And God wants us to learn also how to save. By the way, did you know that 
about 80 to 90 percent of families spend more, 10 percent more than what they earn. And so the Bible is telling us, learn as well how to save. And so what is Jesus highlighting here? Two things. Number one is that earthly possessions, they don't last forever. I mean, we all know this. Our money is subject to inflation. Our possessions, our cars, our um, whatever it is that you have, it is subject to depreciation. Even our bank accounts, you know, it's subject to theft. Even banks nowadays are subject to glitches. And so, you know, we face all of these challenges and problems about money because why? Earthly possessions, they don't last forever. Someone actually wanted to defy this. And so, in his last will and testament, he said to his wife, when I die, I want you to liquidate majority of our assets and convert them to gold buy gold bars, and then put them in a briefcase. And then the day after I die, I want you to put it on top of our attic, okay? Or on our, in our attic. And then what I will do is, as I rise up towards heaven, I'm going to grab it, okay? And bring it with me to heaven. The wife, being very submissive, did as the husband asked, him to, asked her to do. And so... When he was dying, liquidated the majority of the assets, and the day that they, he died, you know, um, he was able, she was able to you know, buy enough gold and put it in one briefcase. And so the day after, she did, as the husband asked her to do, placed that briefcase full of gold in the attic. And then went throughout the day, slept. The next morning, she went up the attic again. She was so surprised. When she was at the attic, she saw... That briefcase in the same place where she left. And she made a remark. She scratched herself and said, I should, have, I should have known. I should have placed it instead of the attic down to the basement. Okay. <clears throat> You'll get it, okay? <laughs> Be patient. It will come, okay? <laughs> oh, thank you for being generous. The point is, our possessions it will not last. Job put it this way. Naked were we when we born. And with nothing as well, we will transcend to eternal life. And so you cannot rely for security. You cannot, you know, you cannot believe the lie that says, if I only have more money, I will be more secure. Because that is a promise that money can never, never fulfill. Jesus continues, instead of storing for yourself treasures on earth, he, he said, you know, but lay for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, again, to explain this, let me tell you what it's not saying. It is not saying that we ought to give so that we can have access to heaven. Okay, you cannot, we will never be able to buy our way into heaven. That's not what it's about. The Bible is very clear when it says we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. It's only because of what Christ has done. It's not dependent on how and how much we give. But what is Jesus saying here? Instead of hoarding for ourselves, Jesus is saying invest in things that will matter for eternity. What are those things that will matter for eternity? Your character. Your walk with God. Some of us, we like to invest in gadgets, but have you ever bought a nice Bible for yourself? That's a good investment that we will also cherish, that will help us prepare for eternity. See, we can invest in ourselves because, you know, ourselves, we, this has an impact in eternity. But not just that, but the people around you as well, it has an impact in eternity. And so what Jesus is saying here, invest in treasures of heaven, it speaks of people as well. You know, I want to share with you um, a very encouraging update. God has opened for us an open door with the Philippine army. And basically... Um, We've had, uh, they gave us a memorandum of agreement so that we can somehow minister to selected um, army officials 
and present to them the word of God and pray for them and, uh, and, and minister to them. I'm so grateful that we have some of Victor Group leaders here who would invest their time, their resources, their prayers. They would invest their, you know, um, um, some of them would even spend for this. They, they, they don't get paid for this. They don't, you know, get something from this, but they would do it and gladly do it for free because they love God and they believe that what they're doing matters for eternity. They're believing that the impact of the word of God in the lives of those young military officers would have an impact in their families, would have an impact in this nation, and would have an impact even in eternity. Many of these army officials receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Can you imagine that? I believe God deserves a hand for that, amen? So can you imagine, I mean, you know, the army opened up, the navy opened up as well, Pastor Rico Rico Ford, we said, you know, even the PNP we're having, and so slowly but surely, somehow the gospel is being preached in our military. Can you, can you imagine what will happen to this nation 20 years from now if we start to invest in the right things? Can we imagine what will happen, how this nation will be transformed if we start investing in people, in people? And treasures in heaven. Jesus went on to share in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why was he asking us not to store treasure on earth, but st store treasure in heaven? Because he's saying there's a direct link between our hearts and our wallets. There is a direct link there is a strong connection between a person's heart and a person's possession. In fact, when you invest in something, most likely, oftentimes, you know, you, your heart will be so attuned to that. You na lang talaga magiging focus mo. If you've ever invested in a particular stock, I'm sure every morning or most of your time, you would be reading about what's happening, how your stock is performing. In fact, how do you know if your heart is in the right thing? How do you know if your heart is not here in this wallet? How do you know that your heart is not there with possessions? A few questions that we can ask ourselves. Number one is, what occupies our thoughts more when we have nothing else to do? What do we fill our mind with? What are we more concerned about? What is it that we fret constantly, okay, are anxious about the most, okay? Apart from our loved ones, what or whom do we most dread losing? What are the things that we measure others by? When we relate with people, how do we relate with them? Do we relate with them as equally? Or do we relate with people who are well-off, sp more special than those who are not? What is it that we know that we cannot be happy without? And if in any of these questions our answer is possessions, money, or wealth, that's a good indicator for us to know that we need to submit this heart to God and allow God to make it in the right place. Take it to the right place. Can you bring out your wallets? Some of you are already wondering what is, what is this guy gonna do, okay? Bring out your wallets. Okay, lift it up. Okay, we're not gonna ask God to fill it, okay? So, <laughs> you know, this wallet has a string to our hearts. Our prayer is that it would never be invested in the wrong things. Amen? Amen. That God is our supplier, not our, not our jobs, not this wallet. It's, this wallet is not our security. Amen? Amen? This wallet is not our significance. Amen? Amen? We believe that God owns everything and God deserves everything as well. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. All right. Can you pass your wallet to the person right there? No, just kidding. <laughs> Some of you are really generous. You really did that. <laughs> Point is, again, Jesus was highlighting. It's not about money per se. It's about the love of money. And God is not after our possession. In fact, God does not need your money. God, He owns everything. But He's more concerned with your heart. And that is why He is commanding us, invest in the right things. 
Verse 22, it says there, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Verse 23, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Jesus now transitions to, from two treasures now to two different kinds of eyes. One bad eye and one good eye. Now, Jesus is not talking about ophthalmology, ophthalmology here, right? He's not talking about the literal eyes, but he's talking about what those eyes represent. See, in Scripture, if you would um, study it, you would see countless or uh, several Scriptures, rather, that somehow relates and interchangeably uses eyes and hearts. Again, building on from what he spoke earlier about our hearts connected to our treasures. In Proverbs 22 or 28, 22, in the New King James Version, it says there, a man with an evil eye, there's that eye, okay, hastens after riches. And does not consider that poverty will come upon him. Proverbs 22, 9, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. What is a good eye and what is a bad eye? Basically, a bad eye is a stingy eye. A bad eye is a greedy eye. And a good eye is a generous eye. See, the problem with, the problem with money is that when we are too focused on money, it will block our perspective. And oftentimes, when our eyes are unhealthy and when we cannot see, you know, um, the things that are happening around us and the things that God wants us to be concerned about, oftentimes we will be too focused with ourselves, our needs, and our wants, making us to want more, to crave more, and to ask for more. That is why Jesus said, spoke about these two eyes. And those good eye, the good eye is a generous eye, able to see the things around us. People who are in need. People who need your help. And not just able to see it, but also having a generous heart to it. That's one of the things that we're praying that we ought to have, that we will have, that we would all have good eyes. I want to commend these people to you. Um, some of our businessmen in church, um, they just have a heart to help others. And um, they're hoping that through their giving and through their investing on people, they would somehow be a blessing to these people. They're not asking for anything in return. They just do it out of their love for God. And so some of our businessmen, that what they would do is they would go to hospitals, pub, uh, public hospitals, and they would um, visit, like in this case, they visited new, uh, a, a public hospital ng Manila, and they visited the moms who just gave birth. And what they did is, yes, they visited, they even gave gifts to them. Diapers, um, milk, crackers, as you see, infant needs to those whom probably don't have access to those things. They would, did not just give them, but they also prayed for them. They also shared the gospel to them, and they really became a blessing to these people. Why? Because they believe it's about investing in what matters for eternity. They, don't, they didn't want to have bad eyes, but they really wanted to be generous towards others. In verse 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Two treasures, two eyes. Ultimately, Jesus is saying it's about having, it's, about, it's a battle between these two masters, two kingdoms. Which kingdom are we part of? See, this is seemingly the power the deceptive power of money. Somehow, there's something about money and possessions that can mimic and can seemingly compare with God. Because money, it promises somehow that if we have more of it, we would be more secure. That if we have it, we would be more significant. That people will value us more if we have money. Things 
that only God can give. But you know what? Man, money, you know, it's a good tool, but it's a horrible, horrible master. In fact, there's this girl who um, suffered the consequences of, you know, not being able to handle money properly. Suffered greed and something, suffered wanting to have more. Her name is uh, Bertha Adams, and um, this woman passed away in 1994. She lived in a nice community in West Coast, Florida. But, you know, to their shock, one day, their neighbors, her neighbors, you know, just noticed some, something that's smelly inside their house, and they called the officials, and when they did, you know, they opened the door, and lo and behold, they found Bertha Adams in her room, alone, and completely shriveled up, okay? And after the autopsy, they found that she died of malnutrition. And when they found out, they asked around, they found out as well that, you know, um, their neighbors would say, oh, you know, that's why, pala, every now and then she would go to us and ask for ask for bread and ask for food. But what was mind-boggling for the police officials at that time was when they searched the house, they found two safes. When they opened one, they were shocked because they found stocks of huge U.S. companies like AT&T. She had stocks there that would amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not just stocks, but even cash, 200,000 in one safe. When they opened the other one, they found 600,000 in the other safe. How could a woman who is that rich die of malnutrition? How could a woman die okay, of hunger when she had those things? Could it be that she wanted more? That she didn't want to touch it because she knew and she thought that's her security. That's her significance. See, money is such a bad master that if your life's pursuit, if you want to please money, it will cost you a lot of things. And in her case, it even cost her her life. Money is such a bad master. That is why Jesus is saying to us, be careful. Be alert, be on your guard that this love for money will not creep in and affect and infect our hearts. How do we combat this? If we are not to love money, then we are to love God. Two days ago uh, was my eldest daughter's birthday and um, she turned nine and to celebrate her birthday, we went to the mall and we wanted to have dinner. And before we went to the dinner, um, I have three kids. Uh, my youngest is six years old, and my youngest said, Dad, can we go around and buy something? Buy a gift for Gabby. Buy a gift for, for my sister. And so I was asking her, okay, where will you get the money? Okay, because if you wanted to buy, of course, I'm going to pay. <laughs> so it's really me who's buying. But thank God, you know, she received a gift from her lolo. And she had, you know, um, uh, some money. And when she had that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this money. And so we went to a bookstore. And since my daughter loves books, she dragged her sister to the books, the kids' book section. And as she was going through the different, uh, the different books, she was saying, Gabby, Gabby, do you like this book? Huh? This one, this one, do you like this book? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll buy this, okay, uh, for you, okay, as my gift. And so she was, and I asked her, can, can we just wait? Can we just look at the prices? I mean, can you afford that? And when we looked, I mean, one is about 300, the other one is about 500 pesos. And she said, do you know how much this is? It will cost you about 800. And so if you have 1,000, okay, 800 will go to your sister and only 200 will be left. Is that okay with you? Yes. <laughs> Grabbed those two books, went to the cashier and paid for it. When I asked her after, why did you do that? Why did you spend that much for your sister? For her, it's very simple. She said, because I love my sister. And you know what? If we don't want money to be an issue for us, we have to check who do we love? Who occupies our hearts? Because if God is our love, then there's nothing too costly 
that He would ask of us. That we will, be, that we will not be generously, generous enough to give. Nothing is too costly for someone that you love. And so the question now is, how do we love God? See, to love God, it does not start from us. To love God genuinely is not about what we do or our works. It starts and it's fueled when we understand how much we are loved by God. It starts by understanding that Christ loved us so much that He gave His life for you and me. See, all other treasures in this world, all other treasures would demand a lot from you. All other treasures would demand even your life just for you to have it. Do we realize that Jesus is the greatest treasure but instead of demanding things for us he willingly laid everything for you and me can you imagine what happened on the cross he was there hung on that cross bleeding for death gasping for air because he could not it's painful for him to breathe he was stripped of his robe he was there practically almost naked and him being naked at that time, it's just a picture of what actually he gave up for you and me. See, Jesus, you know, he is enjoying. He is, he was in heaven. But yet because of his love for us, he decided to let go of the magnificence of heaven and be here and be like us. Experience pain, hunger, shame, just like you and me. And do you know the reason why he was so? The reason why he endured it is because when he looked at you, when he saw you, when he thought about you, he said, this guy's worth it. This woman is worth it. Some say value is determined by the price. Someone is willing to pay for it. Guess what? You are valuable. We are all significant, not because of our possessions, but because someone who is so significant deemed us as significant. We are valuable because someone who is of the ultimate value valued you and me. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, talking about security, talking about being significant in Christ, it says there in verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? How can we be free of greed? Allow the grace of God. Allow the gospel to permeate every aspect, every corner of your heart and see what happens. Because if we know that God was generous for us, if we know that we are secure in God, if we know that we are significant in God, even, be even before all this wealth, you know what? It would be easy for us to be generous, to value people in the way that God sees them to honor them and to relate with them in the way that God wants us to relate with them. I cannot imagine what will happen if all of us here allow the gospel to permeate, permeate every aspect of our hearts. I cannot imagine, I can just only imagine what will happen to our families, to, our, to this church and what God will do through our church, amen, if we would be a people who would know how to invest treasures in heaven who would have a good eye because we have a master who is Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen? Can we all stand up? Lord, we thank you for today. and God, Lord, we commit this time to you. Lord, 
we commit our hearts to you, God, because, Lord, you are after this. You're after our hearts, Lord. You're after our affection. You're after our devotion, Lord God. This is what you care about the most. Can you just put your hand over your heart? Lord, we pray for our hearts. God, if right now, Holy Spirit, we ask, if there's any root, if there's any tinge, Lord God, of uh, greed, if there's any tinge, Lord God, of uh, materialism in us, Lord, I pray that you would expose it. And thank you, Jesus, that your grace will allow us, Lord God, to get rid, to be rid of it. Father, thank you that it is you, Lord God, who will allow us, Lord God, to have a good heart. And for us as well to have a good, good eyes, Lord God, who would allow your light to permeate every aspect of our being, to allow your light for us to see what is happening around us. Lord, I thank you that you want to cause your blessings to flow upon your people. Because you want us to be a blessing to many. In fact, can we just lift up our hands to Him right now? Father, we lift up our hands to You, knowing that You are our provider. Lord, we know that even as You said in Your Word, if You did not spare Your own Son, Lord God, how much more will You not, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Father, You desire for Your people to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. And so I pray, let Your blessings overflow upon every person here, every family represented here, so that we can be a blessing to others, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that we will be a people who will not have bad eyes, Lord, but we will be a people, Lord God, who will have good eyes, able to see, Lord God, needs of others, Lord God, and able to give to the needs of others. Lord, that we would invest not in earthly treasures, but, Lord, we would, you would give us the grace, Lord, to invest on heavenly treasures, Lord. Father, thank you that you will cause us all here to be a blessing to many. And Lord, we receive that. Thank you for the ability to produce wealth, Lord. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your generosity. Lord, may we be channels of those blessings indeed to the people around us, Lord. This is our prayer. This is our faith today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.